Hi there, my name is Keith Zelsberg Dresdahl, and I'm a landscape designer, environmental planner, and I'm here to talk to you today about soils, soil health, and their relationship to climate change. Soils, I've heard, call, are called the skin of the earth, but really they're the skin, they're the gut, and the energy systems that support and drive all ecosystems. And what we want to talk about today is how we can manage soils so that they can be a healthy uh, support for our ecosystems and part of the natural climate solutions that we're trying to discover today. Defined concisely, healthy soils are living ecosystems that sustain plants and animals and help maintain water and nutrient balances to support the activities of people and the other creatures that inhabit this planet. Soils form over hundreds to thousands of years. Uh, it's commonly said that it takes a thousand years to form one centimeter of soil, but that depends on how you measure it. In this region, the biggest soil defining event in recent geology was the glaciation. And as the glaciers melted, huge amounts of sand, and clay, and silt, silt flooded out of these big ice sheets that were a kilometer thick. And by the end of the melting, uh, had deposited much of that in the valleys and leaving the hillsides full of boulders and what we call glacial till, a mishmash of clay, silt, boulders, smaller rocks, and then over the last 15,000 years since the glaciers melted, 10 to 15,000 years, we've had sorting and sifting, and we've had all the biological activity of our habitats that we're familiar with changing that soil so that it's something we recognize today. The difference between dirt and soil is that dirt is just the mineral components, the sand, silt, or clay that make up a living soil, which is that dirt plus life and all of the traces and signals it leaves behind. Healthy soils are like sponges. Over the course of time, the inherent soil, again, that sand, silt, or clay, some combination, is amended with soil carbon and other traces left behind by life. And this soil carbon is the driver of many of the key functions of healthy soils. There are five key functions. They are the productive capacity. What can these soils produce? A very sandy soil. Some of you might know the Montague sand plains with the, the pines. You'll notice that the soils there are very sandy and droughty. Um, and they can support a certain suite of life processes and species, which are very different from the rich uh, upland forest that you might find at the base of the Berkshires, like at the base of uh, Mount Greylock, where we have rich maple forests. That productive capacity varies between those different soils, but a healthy soil is one that can produce uh, healthy ecosystems over time. The second key function is the biological activity and diversity of a soil. So again, they range, they differ just like people differ, but the healthy soil has a, a baseline of healthy life activities. The traces of soil carbon that the activity of life pumps into the soil through photosynthesis and then the metabolic processes of microorganisms and larger organisms that you've all seen like earthworms helps create what we call the dynamic properties of soil. As soils evolve with more life, um, those dynamic properties shift. So the sandy soil of the Montague Plains can only support a certain um, amount of soil carbon storage, which is different than the rich upland soils of the base of Mount Greylock, but um, that enrichment by soil carbon allows two key, the last two key uh, soil functions to occur. You have water storage and filtration and nutrient storage and its availability to 
the plants and animals that inhabit that landscape. Now, soil carbon sequestration and storage that I've talked about before is critical right now as we think about climate change, but it also has some other benefits. As soils become more carbon rich, they can hold more water, and that also means that more water is available to plants and animals, which creates a healthy cycle where those plants and animals thrive, pump more soil carbon in, cycle the nutrients, and those nutrients are more available to other species. At the basic measure, we talk about soil carbon um, in two different forms. We have organic soil carbon, which is the stuff that's changing all the time, and then inorganic carbon, which is like the limestone particles that are stuck in the soil. They're just one component of soil health, but they're the main thing we're gonna be measuring and talking about in a lot of the conversations that are happening right now about soil as a nature-based solution. This is because of the context of climate change. Now, how does carbon get into the soils? It, as I described a little bit before, it's the processes of life, and most specifically, photosynthesis. Trees and other plants reach up and through their biological processes, suck carbon dioxide into their bodies, process them into carbohydrates like sugars, and then share some of that with other life in the soil. Trees actually push 10 to 40% of all of the sugars they make into the soils in the form of exudates within one hour, which is amazing to think about. It goes from carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and become sugar in the soil within one hour. And then the worms and microbes that live in that soil convert that to different stable forms of uh, soil carbon, like organic matter, soil organic matter. And some of it just gets metabolized through their life processes. As you build that soil carbon, you also build nutrient and water holding capacity, as I mentioned before. Water is really critical, and through the research that we and others have done, we found that a 1% increase in soil organic matter, which is the particles of rich brown cake-like humus that you can observe in the soil, if you increase that by 1%, you increase the water holding capacity by 20,000 gallons per acre. Now just imagine uh, what you could do with 20,000 gallons of water, especially if you're thinking in the context of the increasing, more increasingly uh, intense droughts and more frequent droughts that we've all been living through in these last few years. Um, as I've mentioned before, photosynthesis is the driver of soil carbon, and that is one of the drivers of soil health. So as you can imagine, the landscapes that have the greatest photosynthetic capacity are the ones that have typically the greatest soil health. Now in Massachusetts, if you stop doing anything to the landscape and it's not too degraded, what happens? It typically becomes forest within you know, 20 to 50 years. Forests are the largest single land cover in Massachusetts, occupying more than 50% of the total land cover of our state. And they hold 10% of all of the carbon that's stored in life systems in the world. 60% of this, the forested ecosystems, 60% of that carbon is stored in the soils. Now, as you can imagine, as you change the management of landscapes, converting forest to a farm, for instance, you change the photosynthetic capacity and its ability to sequester carbon, and you change the disturbance regime of that soil. What do I mean by that? So it goes from being a forest where the soils are largely disturbed when a tree falls down and a root ball gets pulled up to uh, a condition if it's a farm field where you might be tilling it every year. That process actually exposes the soil to more air and mechanical disturbances and that causes the soil carbon that's held in these humus particles to essentially go into the blender and release that uh, back into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. So it's important to understand that land cover, meaning forest, wetlands, agriculture, parks, 
and the way we manage them affect the dynamic properties, the soil carbon capacity of any particular soil. So where does carbon live in Massachusetts? That was a big question that we've been trying to answer for the last several years. And many people have been trying to answer so they can think about, again, the role soils play in our climate change planning and mitigation strategies. In the course of the last few years, we've delved into all kinds of research and found that in general, you can track the relationship between soil carbon and that land cover, forest, wetlands, etc. And we've used big databases compiled by the Natural Resource Conservation Service over the last 50 years to estimate soil carbon at the state level. In total, we found around 396 million metric tons of soil carbon currently stored in the soils of Massachusetts. Most of that, as you can imagine, or you might imagine, would be stored in forests because of what I described before. Forests cover about 52-54% of the state, depending on how you measure it. But wetlands, which only cover 12% of the state because of some unique chemistry and the structure of their soils actually hold the vast majority of carbon in the state. In total, wetland soils hold something like 321 tons of carbon per acre, whereas forests in Massachusetts only hold about 90 tons per acre. That's a big difference. Agriculture, including pastures, hay, and the cultivated lands that we've talked about, hold about half of what forests hold. Turf and our lawns hold roughly the same amount of agriculture at 40 tons per acre. And our developed landscapes are kind of a mystery because no one's really digging under pavement to measure how much carbon is stored in that soil. But through some deep digging of our own into uh, academic research that's out there, we have estimated that soil carbon content under pavements and in other developed landscapes is around 22 tons per acre. So that's one quarter the amount of our forested lands hold on average and a very small margin of what wetlands can hold. As you change land cover management and type, you change the soil health overall, largely due to both the soil carbon content and also the other activities that you might do when you're changing that. Uh, when you drive a bulldozer across a landscape, you can imagine that you're going to actually mechanically compact. You're gonna squish that uh, soil and that's gonna push out some of the air, which will minimize or reduce the amount of water and air that that soil can hold. It makes it harder for roots and other life to get into that soil, which reduces the capacity of that soil to support life. And so it reduces the photosynthesis that's happening in that space. So it's this negative feedback system where you disturb a soil and it tends to lose capacity for soil health over time in Massachusetts and you know regionally in general we have three big drivers of soil health degradation those are the land conversion that I was describing turning forests into farmlands or um, parking lots obviously affects the soil health in Massachusetts and in Deerfield uh, where you all are going to school the biggest conversion that's happening right now from forests and wetlands is low density residential development. You know, your single family home on an acre or three, and um, that consumes a lot of land. And you can imagine when you build a house, not only are you, you know, clearing the footprint of that house, but it turns out you're impacting three times at least the total footprint of that house on the landscape. So you're converting forests in many cases or farms in many cases to a uh, developed condition. And that sets back the soil health for quite some time, sometimes permanently. You can imagine if you strip off the topsoil and all the vegetation that's feeding that topsoil, you're not going to have the same productive capacity. What else is affecting uh, soil health in Massachusetts? Well, we have climate change that we've been talking about. What happens with climate change? Well, in Deerfield, um, you might remember as, uh, as a kid when Hurricane Irene hit, 
there was massive flooding that happened. In some places, that flooding led to big time erosion. Soils that took thousands of years to form and then all the activities of glaciers to be deposited in, in centuries of enrichment through life immediately was lost when it just washed downstream and into Long Island Sound eventually. So um, flooding is estimated to be more frequent and more intense in the Deerfield watershed um, as with many places in the Northeast. We also have indirect impacts of climate change. Um, in some places, no doubt you've seen footage from Colorado and California, things are on fire every year. Landscapes that did not burn in the past are burning, like in Washington and Oregon, and places that they have burned, they're burning more frequently and more intensely. Some people are starting to look for new places to live. And a lot of people are noticing that the Northeast and Massachusetts um, is a much more stable climate region than those more arid southwestern states. So we project that in the next 50 years, we could see a massive increase in population. Um, and the climate change will also be affecting things globally. The IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change that's convened by the UN, estimates that in 2050, there will be more than 200 million climate refugees moving around at any given year. So some of those people hopefully will be welcomed into the United States, and some of those people will hopefully find refuge here in Massachusetts. But we're gonna have to plan smartly for that so we don't end up clearing all our forests for single family homes and lose all the soil out. Um, the last big vulnerability that our soils have is to how we manage soils in existing land covers. Forests, for instance, don't typically get a lot of management with the, with the exception of occasional logging, um, which in Massachusetts is regulated pretty well. And the soil impacts to that are still not entirely known. Um, it could be that they, they have a major soil release of carbon, but mostly that gets sucked back up over time. But the bigger threat is related again to climate change when we think about forests. Um, many species of trees are currently challenged. You might think of the, wood, the woody adelgid that's infecting the hemlock or the ash trees that are dying everywhere for a variety of reasons. And sugar maples are starting to decline. And as it becomes hotter and drier and more erratic, um, we're likely to see more tree species uh, decline. So one of the big ways that we can help mitigate this vulnerability to our forests is to actively manage them more for climate adapted tree species. So it might mean moving trees that are much more abundant and adapted from like Pennsylvania up to Massachusetts, where they, they, the climate's a little more similar to, to Pennsylvania in decades past. Um, in agriculture, there's a lot of things that we can do. That landscape is managed quite often. I'll talk a little bit more about regenerative agriculture later in, in my talk. Um, but one place in Massachusetts that's really exciting is the potential that lawns have because Together, developed landscapes and lawns cover about 20% of the whole state. One fifth of the whole state is either you know, a yard or a house or a parking lot or whatever. Um, but that lawn has a, a significant potential to uptake more soil carbon if it's managed well. So certain things like just mowing your lawn a little longer, instead of mowing it at two inches, you mow it at three or four inches. That means there's more photosynthetic activity deeper roots, those roots are holding more soil carbon and improving the soil over time. So there's a lot that we can do um, to, to fight against some of these soil vulnerabilities. Um, and in Massachusetts, we were hired to help the state uh, Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs think about how they can use soils and the way we manage them to fight climate change um, through two projects that they're working on. Um, one of them is called the Decarbonization Roadmap for 2050. Uh, it's a mouthful, but basically it's trying to figure out how can we make no net contributions of carbon to the atmosphere by 2050. And some of that's gonna be simple things like converting more fuel inefficient vehicles to more fuel efficient vehicles 
I mean, simple to say, not necessarily simple to do. And, and there's uh, a lot of other more complex things like changing the way energy is produced and moved around in the state. So from a soil health perspective, one of the, the happy coincidences is that soil health improves when we have more carbon. That carbon comes from the atmosphere, so the state is looking for ways to increase the carbon sequestration rate, how quickly atmospheric carbon dioxide is sucked into the soils, and protect the existing pools and stocks of carbon that live there. Um, so we looked at a number of um, ways you might achieve that and came up with these three different scenarios one where you basically don't do anything different than what you're doing that's called business as usual and one that's pretty radical where you say okay we're going to change everything and through that work we found that you could sequester a significant increase of soil organic carbon in the most ambitious scenario you reduce the amount of forest land that's cut for timber you reduce the development impact from forest and farmland conversion to development. And with that, you, you can sequester in just one year in 2050, 1.6 million additional tons of soil organic carbon than you would have uh, without making that change. So that's really significant and um, a hopeful sign. It's not a big percent of the total carbon budget for the state, but it is a significant contribution and something that we have control over. In total, that's about 3% of the total gap between where we're at right now in, in achieving this no net carbon and where we're hoping to get by 2050. Clearly, it's not enough alone. Um, what it suggests is that we need to manage to reduce fossil fuel emissions, first and foremost. Um, but then when we turn our attention to our land and the ecosystems that thrive here, and specifically the soils, the top thing we need to do is to improve the way all lands are managed, as I was describing before. The other thing, the next sort of level down, is to protect places that have exceptionally high pools of soil carbon or really strong sequestration capacity. So that means two things. It means we really need to protect our wetlands and our forests, and especially our forested wetlands, because they have both a strong sequestration capacity and hold a lot of carbon right now. And if you convert those, it's like a carbon bomb. You're releasing it to the atmosphere. And then we need to restore some lands that have been degraded over time to be more uh, carbon rich. And that could mean intensive activities like actually pulling up asphalt and adding compost or more sort of simple changes where we just allow um, reforestation to occur. But that regeneration of soil health is really important. Um, when we look back out to the global scale, um, I really like to look at uh, a project called Project Drawdown, which if you're not familiar with, it's totally worth checking out. They have a great website. And what they did was they looked at the top 100 most impactful climate solutions that are out there. And they illustrate in a, in a number of infographics the relationship between the different solutions and the different problems that are out there. And this slide that uh, you're looking at right now shows that almost 25% of all current sources, all emissions of greenhouse gases, including carbon dioxide, but methane and others, come from the way we grow our food and manage the land that's around that food production. And right now, our current contribution to the atmosphere is still 59% more than the entire sinks that occur into soils and the ocean over time each year. And so one of the things that we need to do in addition uh, to reducing the emissions from these land-based solutions is to accelerate and improve the way sequestration happens. And um, I've been working in, in Deerfield uh, and other places in Massachusetts to help figure out how we might do that. And I've been describing to you the, the way we can manage our forests. Um, there are wetland solutions. We had a really cool meeting the other day with some young people who were building what's called an anaerobic digester. That's a basically a dumpster where you put food scraps and seal it off from the, the air 
and allow anaerobic digestion in the, in the absence of oxygen to occur, which generates what? It generates methane, which is a problem generally when you think about um, food decomposing in a landfill. But they then take that methane and use it to power a little factory right there to turn that food waste into fertilizer, actually a, a bio accelerator. So there's some really exciting ways that we can do that. So then that you're avoiding emissions from poorly managed decomposition of food scraps, and you're turning it into a net benefit by helping accelerate the productive capacity of, of the land. Um, I'm talking about this in Deerfield because one of the things that we might do uh, on any of our farms or our lawns is to help add organic matter back into the landscape and inoculate with like probiotics uh, the beneficial microorganisms that drive the carbon processes in our soils. So this uh, company that I was talking about is a way that we can both avoid emissions and increase sequestration over time. Um, these are some recent college graduates uh, who went to Williams College right here in Massachusetts. If you're curious, the name of their company is Soil Sauce. Um, so in Deerfield, unlike much of the state, we have a, a much higher prevalence of agriculture, regenerative agriculture, which we can define as any process, any agricultural practice that rehabilitates the entire ecosystem and enhances natural resources rather than degrading them, primarily by rebuilding soil organic carbon and the biodiversity that it supports is something that we need in Deerfield and beyond. And there are a number of essential practices that are being proposed right now. And these include things like reducing tillage. So using no or low till systems, retaining crop residues. Instead of clearing your field after a crop, you either till that back in or better yet, just allow it to decompose in place. Uh, you diversify your crop rotation. So instead of growing silage corn on the same parcel for, you know, ever, you could rotate that through several different crop cycles and that helps support the biological diversity in the soil and the nutrient profile in the soil and increases soil health. But adding perennials, including trees or even grasses to our agricultural systems is one of the ways that we can really change the carbon dynamics of the way that works. And there's a lot of barriers that farmers face in doing that. Like you need different equipment, you need different uh, timing, and you need different inputs in terms of nutrients. But over three to five years, farmers that employ these practices can see their soil organic matter go up by as much as, a, as one third of a ton per acre. Um, and so in terms of organic matter, that could be anywhere from a one to 3% increase depending on where that was. So again, that's gonna retain a lot more water, a lot more nutrient, and ultimately make the viability of that farm business uh, better over time. So, you know, there's a lot of um, scary things happening right now. Um, in, the, in the world related to climate change, and there's a lot of big problems. Uh, but by being better stewards of our soils and the ecosystems that they support, we can contribute to the solution. And so one of the challenges that I think you're gonna be facing is how can you make a livelihood that is in alignment with that critical work? And, and the work of regenerative agriculture, regenerative forestry, um, and, and other sort of resilience planning efforts, I think is gonna be abundant and worth considering as you are continuing your studies. And I um, welcome any of you to reach out if you wanna learn more about soil health um, and look forward to doing some of the field sessions that we'll be doing later this spring. Thank you so much.